starting at nine. Thank you, Nicole. Let me get that my screen. And um, I want to make sure that you know um, <clears throat> we have your um, attention for the hour or so. Um, and then you can move on with your day. So thank you for joining everybody and welcome. Um, we are recording today's webinar. Um, if you don't feel comfortable with your camera on, please feel free to turn that off. Um, but we do appreciate um, your time and energy um, and you know any comments and um, questions that you might have in this next hour. So we'll go ahead and get started. So um, we've been bringing you through EPIS, a webinar series of best practices in sustaining evidence-based programs. And today's uh, webinar is around stakeholder engagement. Um, so we're really excited to bring you some information around this and, and um, have a nice presentation. Again, if you haven't been on the previous webinars, this is our implementation specialist team here at Penn State EPIS. Um, I'm Janine Burris. We also have um, with us today, Heather Roberts, Jordan Joyce, and Nicole Wells. So this is a list of our series, right? The five uh, webinars in our best practices in sustainability, and we are smack dab in the middle. We are at stakeholder engagement. <clears throat> and as you can see um, from the schedule, we do have two more in upcoming weeks in October, October 12th and October 26th. So we hope to see you um, on those webinars. Okay, so stakeholder engagement. Um, these are today's objectives. I'm not gonna go through them because you're gonna hear about them and see them in upcoming slides. Um, but these are our, our objectives today. Um, so we're gonna go through and I'm gonna provide you with some information um, and hopefully get you thinking around engagement. Um, and then we're gonna also hear from Jeff Hogan, um, who's on today. Um, with, I'll call it a case study, and to provide information for you all um, that's relevant. Okay, so to start, um, I think we'd like to review uh, some of the feedback um, that we had received, um, in particular stakeholder engagement um, from the initial sustainability survey that we had provided during registration. Um, I love, I love this graphic and Nicole, thank you very much. She did a fabulous job with this slide. Um, <clears throat> but these were some of the answers that came to us around how do you build engagement for collaboration and why is it important? So take a look at it um, and you know, just kind of noting some of the answers um, <clears throat> and some of the thoughts from folks were um, you know, following through and delivering on promises building something bigger than you can build alone, which I think is fabulous. Um, having flexibility, which is huge, right? Making collaboration a pleasant experience. Um, your particular community nurturing the engagement, which is collaboration. And listening to all the voices, not just the loudest, which I think is really important. Um, I also want to say at this stage, too, that stakeholder engagement and community engagement can be viewed with the same lens. Um, some people do interchange um, the, those words, stakeholder um, and community. Um, it's important to note that stakeholders and the community at large both have a vested interest in your agency and the programs that you're bringing for different reasons. Um, thus, you'll hear us use these terms interchangeably during this discussion. Okay, so if we want to kind of get down to a definition of engagement, um, <clears throat> we want to talk about the process of working collaboratively with and through groups of people affiliated by geographic proximity, special interests, or similar situations to address issues affecting the well-being of those people. Community engagement is a way of ensuring that community members have access to valued social settings, activities, and programs, and that they feel they're able to contribute meaningfully to those settings, activities, and programs. Um, also to develop functional capabilities that 
um, enable them to participate fully in what's going on, breaking down barriers to participation and contribution as a whole is really essential to engagement. Okay, here are some core principles of community engagement. Again, as I said um, just a minute ago, I, I do like to interchange stakeholder and community. Um, so <clears throat> community engagement, what are some of those core principles? This was taken from David Matthews um, Connections 2008, focus on communities um, through the Kettering Foundation. So I don't wanna give a shout out to that. Um, so the first one is around um, careful planning and preparation, right? So through adequate and inclusive planning, ensuring that the design organization and convening of the engagement process serves both a clearly defined purpose and the needs of the participants at the same time. The next one is inclusion and demographic diversity. Um, so in, a, in an equitable way, we want to incorporate diverse people, voices, ideas, and information that lay the groundwork for quality outcomes and democratic legitimacy. The next is collaboration and shared purpose. Supporting and encouraging participants, government and community institutions, and others to work together to advance that common good and the common goals of your community and your agency and your programming. Openness and learning, helping all involved to really listen to each other, exploring new ideas unconstrained by predetermined outcomes, learning and applying information in different ways that generate new options, and rigorously evaluating your community engagement activities for effectiveness. Transparency and trust, being clear and open about the process and providing a public record of the organizers, sponsors, outcomes, and range of views and ideas that are being expressed. Impact and action, ensuring each participatory effort has real potential to make a difference and that participants are aware of that potential and their own potential as they engage with you. And sustained engagement and participatory culture, um, promoting a culture of participation with programs and institutions that support ongoing quality community engagement. So again, these are just some of the core principles. Um, that was a lot of information, but just making sure that that's occurring um, as you're looking to engage, um, you know, the folks in your community as well as your stakeholders. Okay, so what are some of the goals of engagement? <clears throat> there can be a lot, right? Um, depending on the agency, the coalition, um, community, et cetera. And it also depends on the different models you choose to use. So, um, you know, in, in preparing, there are a lot of different models and a lot of different um, sort of um, uh, keywords in terms of what goals you have around engagement. Um, but, but three that we wanted to pull out today were the capability, right? The members of, of your community and the members um, that are working, um, that you're engaging are capable of dialogue and decision-making. That's very important. Um, that there's commitment. Um, there's a mutual benefit beyond self-interest. This can also be viewed as relationship development with the others in your community, uh, working for a common goal. Capacity building is also occurring when the number of people grows who are committed to that common goal. And contribution. Members um, volunteer within an environment that encourages them to take responsibility and take risks in terms of um, furthering those common goals in your community. Okay, so who are your stakeholders? <clears throat> I'm going to name some of the more common answers, <laughs> um, but I want you to think about who else you can add to this list. So I'm going to go through some of the more common ones, um, but think about who else. And as I'm listing, um, if you want to note others, 
that you don't hear um, coming from me, please add those to the chat. Okay, so who are your stakeholders? Coalitions, right? Definitely coalitions, schools, um, your county agencies, the SCA, CYS, JPO, <clears throat> the youth and families that are participating in your programming, as well as the staff delivering your programming. They are all your stakeholders. Faith-based organizations, human service agencies, nonprofits, your funders. Can't forget about your funders. Okay, who else? Anyone I didn't mention that's really important or, or that we might not think of um, as far as a stakeholder. Okay. Well, think about it. Think if there's anybody else, please still feel free to put that in the chat if you wish. And um, we will keep rolling on. I don't think I exhausted the list, but you never know. Okay. Okay. So let's move on to some challenges. What are some challenges to engagement? Challenges can be viewed um, as internal versus external, but please know that they can absolutely be both internal and external at the same time. The first one is around cultural differences. Um, this is something that um, you should think about um, in terms of you know, where your agency lies, as well as your stakeholders in the community. Are there differences? Um, sometimes you really have to dig deep in that. Um, you may think on the surface there aren't, um, but there absolutely could be. Power dynamics. So this is um, one where you really need to be reflective and honest about this. And this can be really difficult to do. Are there power dynamics within your agency or organization? And then are there power dynamics as you are um, engaging in different ways um, and means with your community or with your stakeholders? Um, that's something that you, know, you really need to be honest about. Lack of incentives for those involved. So keeping everyone's eyes on the prize with this, it can be very challenging. And these can be tangible and intangible, right? Um, you can provide um, or try to provide um, tangible incentives, um, you know, engaging your community um, with meetings and such and, and providing a meal, um, which is something small um, or beverages, um, but those intangible things um, <clears throat> that can be a challenge, making sure those that you are engaging um, understand um, and are constantly being informed of um, the positives that are coming from the hard work that you're all doing together, um, such as, you know, reviewing pays, protective factors, and any, um, you know, change in that positively. Um, that, that is so important, um, but that is also a, a more intangible um, thing and making sure that that's an incentive for people to keep doing the good work they're doing. And last but not least, operational factors. So a challenge could be, you know, the lack of time that people have. We're all being pulled in different directions. And I'll say a current challenge is the virtualness of how we're all doing our work right now. Um, that's a, that can be a real huge challenge. Um, and money, of course. Um, money is always a challenge. So these are just a few of them. There are definitely more, um, but we wanted to just uh, note these in particular. Okay, the why. Why is engaging multiple stakeholders and community members in your program important to sustainability? Big question. Um, so here are some reasons why. Um, your stakeholders and community members understand a variety of conditions of your community at any given moment. Um, you may be, uh, oh, it's easy to tunnel vision, right? Um, so having different perspectives 
and understanding what's going on in different parts of the community that you might not be privy to um, is, is very important. Um, and and it's, it's really important to have that voice. Um, your community members and stakeholders possess a wealth of diverse information. Diversity um, is uh, a, a big area of focus right now, as well it should be. And so we want to make sure that all parts of the community, all stakeholders are being heard so that programming um, can reach everybody um, in, a, in a true universal way. Uh, your community members provide multiple outlets to promote your reputation of providing high quality evidence-based programming. Um, you want your reputation to be intact and um, to be positive at any given moment with any given audience in any given way. Um, so your stakeholders and community members are the vehicles in which um, you know, your good reputation gets out there um, at any point that they're talking to others in the community. Building relationships across different sectors is also hugely important um, to sustainability. Again, um, I think with universal programming in particular, it's easy to say, well, it's a universal program, so you know we accept everybody um, to participate. Um, but are we really reaching everybody? Um, so, you know, having folks go out and, um, you know, reach different sectors of the community um, that you might not be reaching or think you're reaching, but you're not, is really important. And they can provide you with a better understanding of community priorities and the priorities of your particular stakeholders. So again, it's really easy to um, have this false sense of, well, we totally understand everything going on with the community, with everybody in the community um, and where the community's priorities are. Um, but without that constant community engagement um, from different people, from different sectors, um, I think we can be lulled into this false sense of, we know all when really there are other things going on. Um, and you know we need to make sure we're continuing to understand that and that we're continuing to address those needs. Okay, so communicating with stakeholders um, for sustainability, here are some strategies to consider. There are more, um, we just wanted to throw a few out there um, for communication. So information dissemination, um, this is important um, when you're talking about, <clears throat> excuse me, when you're talking about your program um, in terms of how it's delivered and what the program is in terms of outcomes. Um, so you wanna get that information out to your community members um, and your stakeholders are uh, you know, a good vehicle in which to do that. So think of MOUs, think of reports, briefings, press releases, brochures, and of course, social media um, is a big one in terms of disseminating information. Um, another strategy is gathering feedback. Um, so this can come in the form of um, surveys, uh, focus groups, advisory boards, uh, forums. Um, you know, that's gathering feedback from other folks in the community to ensure that um, you're reaching um, the people with the right information, with the right programs, and um, you know you just need that that information coming back to you to see where you might need to pivot or whether you're on the right track. And involvement is is a final strategy on here. So thinking about work groups and committees, joint programming. Um, forming alliances with others. Those are some other ways um, to get involved and um, you know, to sustain what you're doing. So those are, those are three that I wanted to um, relay to you all today. Okay, Mr. Jeff Hogan, <laughs> thank you so much for joining us today. There's a nice big picture of you. Um, 
So I do want to, if you don't know Jeff already, I do want to introduce Jeff Hogan. He is um, an EPIS systems change specialist, and he has a variety of experience coming today to the webinar um, as a CTC mobilizer, a program coordinator, um, being funded with PCCD monies for evidence-based programs in his community, um, and now as a systems change specialist helping others across the state. Um, so Jeff is gonna share with you some tips and ideas um, in terms of um, what he's done to engage um, his community members, his stakeholders um, to sustain. And I do just wanna note, um, Jeff, before I turn it over to you, that you may have heard of some of these already um, on this webinar, um, what I've just relayed on other webinars um, that you've attended. Um, so, you know, just know that means that what he's relating and these points are certainly noteworthy to show what works. So I wanna put that out there that if you're hearing things over and over again, we're feeling like this is what's gonna work. Um, and they're, you know, tried and true and tested and, and you know, successful. So. Jeff, without further ado, um, please take it away. Thank you very much. Sure, <clears throat> that's an awesome lead in, but uh, you shared most of the information I was gonna share, so now I gotta figure out where to start. <laughs> I, I was thinking I should have worn the same uh, shirt and tie today just to mess with everybody as the picture, but uh, didn't, didn't feel like putting on a tie today. Um, hello to everybody. I know a lot of you on, on the call. Um, some of you I don't. Um, it's nice to meet you. If you ever have any questions from, um, I'm sure you work with a lot with our implementation specialists. If you ever have questions, you know, coalition related or um, CTC specific or many other things, please feel free to reach out to me. I'll put my email address in the chat when we're done. If you can go to the first slide. I'm not sure if it's Janine or Nicole running them. I wasn't sure who to reference there. Janine, okay. Um, I pulled three slides from a learning community call that we did a few weeks ago on sustainability and funding for coalitions. So I want to put out there that as, as I talk through these things, you'll hear me talk a lot about funding and sustainability, but I'll ask you to think through these in terms of how they apply to stakeholder engagement. I'm going to try to tie some of those concepts in, but I know as I've talked through these several times before, I've been focused directly on funding and sustainability, so I may miss that tie in. Um, also, these slides were created in partnership with um, kind of my mentor when I was a community mobilizer. Her name was Kathy Peffer. Many of you probably know her. She was from Lower Dauphin Communities That Care. And we've done a webinar or a learning community, as we call it twice, on funding and sustainability. And she's been my um, co-facilitator and helped me to create these slides. So Kathy and I's perspectives may differ from yours. Kathy and I both led 501c3s. We were in more rural communities, and we recognized that one of the great things about our work is that all of our communities are different. So what worked for us may look different from you, but I hope that even if your community looks very different, you're able to take some of these concepts and apply them in a way that fits your community. One of the first one on there, it, it, for, this is more for me maybe than some of you. I'm not good. I think I shared this with Janine and Nicole. I'm not good with um, with getting told no. <laughs> I don't like to hear that. I don't like you know to hear anybody say no. So when I started this work, it was really a struggle for me to make that ask if I thought that it might be a no. And I went to a training one time and the, the facilitator, the trainer, her, her tagline was go for no. And that's, that stood out to me because that wasn't something that I was good at. And I recognized there were a lot of places in my coalition work, whether it was asking for funding or asking for somebody to join our coalition or asking for volunteers, at, you know, so many different things I, I wasn't doing that I probably should have been doing because you know what, it might've been uncomfortable if they told me no. And that kind of changed the way I looked at those things because her, her, her training, her, her, her uh, you know, mindset during that was basically, if you don't go for a no, you're never going to get a yes. And you're not going to get a yes on every single ask, on every single grant that you write, on uh, every single person that you ask to join your coalition. But if you don't make the ask, you're never going to get a yes. The second one might be the biggest one that I talk about today is building relationships. And it seems like, okay, we know about relationships. Relationships are important, especially when we're talking about stakeholder engagement. 
But the biggest thing I can say, whether it's funding, whether it's uh, stakeholder engagement, whether it's getting members for your coalition or volunteers, relationships are the most important thing that I've seen in this work whenever I was a community mobilizer. And I'll just give you a quick example. Um, when we started our coalition, we were following the Communities That Care model. And I see some of you on the call, I know follow that model as well. And one of the, the parts of that model kind of in phase two pretty early on is to get together work groups and to start this work. And you'll see uh, about halfway down the slide is developing a committee for sustainability. One of the work groups in the CTC model is, is funding and sustainability. And one of the ladies that we invited to join our uh, funding and sustainability uh, committee or work group, depending on what you call them, uh, early on, she formed some relationships. She was a member of a church, very active in her church, ended up having four members of that church uh, join as active uh, volunteers, members of our coalition. Uh, that pastor took the information to the local ministerium meetings and other pastors, some joined within with the coalition work, but they all took the information back to their, their congregations. We had um, certain churches that would provide resources. How many of you do programs like Strengthening Families 10 to 14? I can't see everybody's hands up. I see Julie's hand up. I'm trying to cycle through the, the, uh, your views on the, on the right side of my screen. Um, Julie, or anybody else that I didn't see raised your hand, is it easy to find food for those families if you do Strengthening Families 10 to 14 in person? Please feel free to unmute or use chat. Not always. Um, currently, under our grant, we've built um, incentives in and include food incentive. And because we're virtual, at this point, we've been sending gift cards. Great. Are you comfortable sharing about how much it costs for that seven-week program for food? Um, we've been sending, uh, let's see. So it would be about $70 per family. Great. So in, the, in that program, if um, I'm not one of the program implementation specialists, but from what my, my memory tells me, about 10 families is what um, is usually in that program at a given time. So you can you know, do the multiplication, and that's like $700. And what we saw uh, was, was pretty similar in my coalition. So what happened from those relationships that we formed early on, those churches took the information back to their congregation and we had several of those churches would provide a meal. They would say, we'll take week three or we'll take week four. And that was such a, you know, a relief for us. As the coordinator, that was a relief not having to plan and going and picking up deliveries and you know, getting all the food arranged, but also from a, from a financial standpoint, it was great. And those, those, those um, congregations were aware of the efforts like that that were taking place in the community. And then whenever I joined EPIS, one of the things that I had to do kind of early on was to find people to replace all the roles that I was doing with our coalition. And one of those was our positive action program. How many of you do a, a universal prevention program in your elementary schools in some way? Positive action or PASS or IY? I see Sammy's hand up. Brandon, I saw your hand up. Great. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't see you join, Brandon. Nice to see you. Um, so the, another different congregation of church, their, their pastor and his wife volunteered to take on our positive action program whenever I joined up is because they were familiar with those efforts and the community really was able to get behind those. So the, the main point of this um, bullet is those relationships can play such a huge part in so many ways for coalition work, whether it's funding, whether it's those uh, volunteer hours, um, just getting members of your coalition and input, as well as things like the resources for um, those, the food for strengthening families is one that keeps coming back to my mind for that. The next one, and please, um, I like this to be interactive. Please feel free to use chat or to unmute and ask a question. If anything pops into your head during this, um, I don't want this to feel like you have to wait until the end or anything. Please feel free to stop uh, stop me while we're going and ask questions or share hey, your own experiences. Hey, yeah. Joe. I, ahead, just want to pass, I just want to pass along too for the any type of program that you're doing for food. Don't forget to check out your local high schools for their, um, their uh, what they call them, but the, the classes that where they're teaching cooking 
um, especially if you have a tech a tech program in the school because they're always looking for places to make food for whether it's breakfast or or dinner so don't forget them oh sammy that's an amazing point and i will share my own experience with that we did the way my coalition started to recruit members the group um, kind of right before i joined decided to have a community-wide thanksgiving uh free community thanksgiving meal where food was provided to the community for two purposes one was to provide a meal because one of the things that we saw early on in our community there are a lot of economic disparities and not everybody has great accesses to food or the same accesses to food but also it was a recruiting event uh, to get members for the coalition and we we gave everybody a free meal and took everybody upstairs to the auditorium and i shared with them what communities that care was and some of the members still joke like i came for a meal and i ended up as a member and a volunteer and you know all those other things but every year that we did it our schools, um, their home ec classes would home, hand make homemade pumpkin pies for that dinner. And that was like the favorite part. Usually I, I can't eat before I speak. I don't know if anybody else is like me, but I was always like take the doggy back home after that event because I got, would get too nervous about speaking. But there was never any pumpkin pie left because that was what was always gone. Um, people would go back for seconds from it. Thank you, Sammy. The next thing on here, diversify funding. It's so important in the work that we do, and I'm sure this applies to stakeholders as well. But in this um, presentation, it was intended to show a lot of us, we, we look at our budgets, we're like, okay, yep, that's taken care of. Um, but what if it all comes from one agency? What if that agency, and it, this happened with my own coalition, a lot of our funding came from the county early on to start. And one of the, you know, I think it was the second or third year, the county came back and said, hey, we're going to, we're going to cut, I forget how much it was, about $20,000 out of your budget for the next year. If we weren't continuing to work on diversifying the previous year, we wouldn't have had a plan in place because that, that was an email that came, I think, about June 15th, and it was the effect change was start, you know effective July 1. Um, so you really have to be planning for those and diversifying throughout your work. Uh, this one is kind of, the next one is kind of more focused on funding, but pursuing grants are great but pursue grants that fit, fit your mission and don't rely solely on them. And one of the, the things that I've you know, tried to share with as many people as possible is in our work, so many of us do this, um, you'll see a grant posted and you'll think, how can I use that? Can I, can I put in place, I'll go back to the program we just talked about, strengthening families 10 to 14. I can use this and I can put strengthening families 10 to 14 in place in my community. What I encourage everybody to do is really look at your community, look at your data that you have available as it pays, as it other data and say, does that, is that program what provides what our community needs the most? Because that grant might be for a year, it might be for two years. If you're looking at something like DFC grant, it might be longer, but there's gonna come a time when that grant ends and you have to figure out how you're gonna to continue to fund and sustain that within your community, whether it's through dollars, whether it's through in-kind services, whether it's through volunteers or that food for strengthening families. And at the end of that grant, is are you gonna be able to find ways to sustain it? And is that the uh, program that fits your mission? So just to encourage everybody to think about those things whenever you apply for grants too. We talked about the committee earlier. It's so great um, as a coordinator or a facilitator or mobilizer, we tend to take that work on ourselves. And I was extremely guilty of this when I was a mobilizer. So I try to say that as often as I can now, um, but really the coalition work is, is representing the entire community. And as Janine said earlier, all of those stakeholders. So if you're able to, if it fits the way your coalition is set up, develop a committee for it and have people share that work. Um, asking individuals and businesses uh, for donations. Sometimes we think of the bigger buckets, but let me just give you a quick example of this. This may be even on the next slide. How many of you are familiar with Amazon Smile? So how many of you use Amazon Smile when you shop on Amazon? I see some hands up. I didn't know about this until I got into this work and I tried to as a mobilizer kind of you know yell this every chance I got because it's such a small thing Amazon smile is you have to log in to Amazon smile and it doesn't work from your phone you can't it, like smile.amazon.com instead of www.amazon.com and it doesn't work from the phone app but if you can encourage people in your community to use Amazon smile when they shop on Amazon I always told them pick any nonprofit in the community that fits you know your beliefs but pick ours if it fits, because that's great. But I'd rather see it be any uh, nonprofit in the community than, than none. But if you use smile.amazon.com, smile if you're not familiar with that, they provide half a percent of every purchase 
to a nonprofit of your choice. So I'm going to have to do the math in my head real quick, but if you spend, what is it, $1,000 on something on Amazon, it's what, what is 5% of that? Half or half a percent. $5 comes back to your coalition. But if you think, how many families spend $1,000 on Amazon every year in your community in the area you cover? That becomes a pretty big number pretty quick. And asking people for um, those businesses and individuals for that, those maybe it's five, ten dollars a month. But if people in your community are able to understand your mission and get behind those things, that can really add up. Or maybe they can provide in-kind services. If you're looking at that strengthening families 10 to 14, they're familiar with what you're doing. Maybe they say, hey, we have a location that you can use to do that program and it saves you a lot of costs associated with finding a building or space to do the program. Uh, program sponsorship is, is, a, is a nice one down here that, that often isn't thought of. Let's say you're doing, and I keep using strengthening families 10 to 14, but insert whatever program you're doing. Um, here. If you're doing that program and you're thinking, how are we going to fund that? Maybe it's going to cost you $20,000 to do a program or, you know, insert the dollar number based on your area and based on your program. Maybe there's a company in your community that will say, hey, we'll sponsor that. This, let's make this Strengthening Families 10 to 14 sponsored by uh, Janine and Nicole Incorporated. I don't know what the company name is in your community, but I do know of a coalition who wanted to do a book bus. They recognized that uh, literacy, early literacy was a challenge in their community and they wanted to solve that. They wanted a book bus and they weren't sure how they were gonna pay for that. They went to a company and asked for the funding from the company and the company's name would be all over the book bus and all of their marketing that went out would have the company's name on it. The company paid $148,000 for their second book bus. I think they paid for a first book bus too that was, that was significantly cheaper. But when you think of um, the number of dollars and cents that were available there for that book bus that they then turned into being able to serve hot meals out of too, how much could $148,000 help your funding and sustainability efforts for the programs that you're doing right now? That was just one company. Um, I think we have a question here. I see a hand up. I'm gonna probably pronounce your name wrong. Dion, Dione? I'm sorry, that's not supposed to be there. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. I, I didn't want to roll past it and miss your question if you had a good one. Um, again, please feel free to put your hand up or unmute if you guys have any questions or, or comments like Sammy did earlier to further these conversations. The last point on this slide was to collaborate and share resources. And this is, uh, you know, being a mobilizer facilitator, some, you know, before sometimes we think of these things, these are our programs, you know, this is, this is our, uh, this is our program, or these are the things that our coalition is doing. If you're able to partner with other groups, uh, sometimes you can further your efforts, you can help them, and you can provide more resources to your community. Does anybody have a good example of collaborating or sharing resources with another group in your community? Okay, I have one from actually from the facilitator, the mobilizer that replaced me at my old position. Um, she brought skills to the coalition that I didn't have. She worked um, a few hours a week for a local newspaper. And we were spending a ton of money on printing resources and flyers and trifolds and bifolds and you know all kinds of things for our community. And she, with her relationship, was able to get those services much, much cheaper. And also the, um, the printing costs then were able to go to a local company that was, um, that was you know, kind of not making a ton of money, I will say. Um, so it benefited both the coalition and the, the printing company. Uh, Debbie shared um, uh, an example with me with their school district and their educational foundation. So many school districts now have educational foundations and those collaborations sometimes. Yes, great example. Thank you, Debbie. Yeah, you, if I have a it, similar story oh, to your printing one. Yes, please go ahead. Um, our uh, collaboration runs a youth collaboration as well. And one of our past youth coalition members is now four or five years out of high school and she works for a print shop. <clears throat> and she recently, we had her come in recently and do a presentation about the print shop and what they might have to offer. And we've just moved all of our business over to them. And they're also a local uh, company. 
and you know we're supporting a past youth coalition member the local uh a local business and it's a cheaper price so we you know win-win all around great point it's, it's sometimes hard to to think about how those things might fit in but it can be as, you, as sammy said a win-win a win for your coalition a win for those programs a win for the other organization and maybe more importantly, a win for all of those stakeholders that Janine talked about earlier, the youth in the community and being able to provide more resources. Does anybody have any questions or other comments to about the, the bullets on this slide before we move to the next one? I just have two more before we... All right, let's dive to the next one. Okay, so this uh, first one probably applies to uh, your stakeholders too, but never allow your funding sources to go stagnant. I used that one example early on where the county kind of uh, reallocated some funding and uh, there was less funding available for, you know, we had, had like one month notice for funding. The same might be true for your stakeholders, for your volunteers, for the members of your coalition. As you look at who's involved with the coalition right now, what if somebody what if somebody moved out of your community and was no longer able to participate? Would you still have representation for the sector or sectors that that person represents? Um, as a sad example for my community, we had a member uh, that was super, super active, uh, was the, for my own coalition, this is hitting me close to home right now, but I'll, I'll try to share it and try not to get emotional because I'm usually, I kind of wear my emotions on my sleeve, but my old coalition, uh, we had a member who was super involved, was an officer, was the treasurer, uh, participated in every group in the community. You can think of the historical society, uh, her church, the Audubon Society, the, the, all of the higher levels of the, the, the uh, church uh, government, for lack of a better term. Um, she passed away suddenly just a couple of weeks ago. Those are all gaps now that need to be filled. And I just, as we think about this with funding, think about how you can diversify and make sure that your stakeholders continue to be engaged. If somebody leaves your coalition, if um, you have one person maybe, let's say, involved from media, what happens if that person changes jobs or they move out of the community or something you know, worse happens, like it just happened in my community? Find ways to um, diversify and plan for those things ahead of time is the best advice I can give. It's not always easy, but uh, in those downtimes, try to do some strategic thinking about how to do that. Using PR events for more than money, I will share with you, and uh, some of you may disagree with me on this, I am I am like not a bake sale person. I am not a fan of doing bake sales to raise money for this work. For some people it works, for me, one, it's not my thing, and two, um, we didn't we didn't use, we didn't raise a ton of money when we did things like that in my coalition. But I'll give you one quick example. Thank you very much, Julie. Um, one quick example for the, the events that, that is on my mind. We did one time a community festival, it was like two days. We did a booth, the members all donated baskets and we got a small games of chance license and did a basket raffle. And I will share with you the members and uh, myself probably spent more money on the baskets than what we raised financially from selling tickets for the raffle. Um, but we spent all weekend handing out bifolds and trifolds and getting uh, the information out into the community and probably had a much bigger impact both financially and in terms of um, engagement from the community with all those stakeholders that Janine mentioned earlier, all, all across all the spectrums from having that booth and having uh, people that I handed out flyers to and had conversations with all weekend. Um, so when you do events, it's it's easy to think, okay, we got to pay for the site, we got to pay for the small game, the chance license in that example, we had to pay for you know a lot of other things. Um, think about all the other benefits that can be provided. Um, using your pays data and CTC evidence, I'm gonna tie these two together as you're talking to actually the next three, I think. Use your data, be able to tell your story to people in the community. As you're walking down the street, as you, I always say elevator speech from my, you know, my time in the private sector, we always called it an elevator speech, but you may get 30 seconds in the elevator with somebody. You may um, be passing some, somebody on the way to a meeting, uh, maybe at the local courthouse and you pass one of the commissioners and you have 20 or 30 seconds where they ask you a question. What is the story you're gonna tell? What data are you gonna share from your coalition? 
if you're at the supermarket and you know a local mom maybe says, hey, tell me about this program that you're doing uh, over at the church next week. And you say, oh, let me tell you about, that's called Strengthening Families 10 to 14, just as an example. Have your information ready, be ready to tell that story because in those small moments, you may get a chance to impact uh, not just that one person, but everybody that they might share that information with. So it can impact your funding, can impact stakeholder engagement, can impact all the other people that they're sharing the information with in your community. I started to mention this one earlier, don't have drift. It's easy to, you know, we think about in terms of grants, you know, saying, oh, this, there's a grant right now that's posted for X. Let's apply for that. Um, try to stay focused on your priorities. If you're, you know, a CTC community especially, but no matter what your designation is, CTC, DFC, you know, whatever, uh, Prosper, um, they all have similar ways of looking at your data and creating priorities that you focus on for your community. And my advice is stay true to those because if you do that, you're less likely to see drift away from your mission. You're more likely to be able to provide funding, provide volunteers, provide stakeholder engagement for the efforts that you've identified are most important for your communities. And it's easy to say, let's do X, Y, or Z. In my community, it was, we started doing a backpack program for food and we started to do, um, my wife had the idea to do a laundry service where we would provide uh, free laundry services. We recognized that uh, not every young person in the community had, you know, cleanest and, and best clothes. And we wanted to, to limit some of those gaps. It's easy to start spending a ton of time and resources on those things. And I'm not saying don't do them because those things are great to do. And if they fit your mission and they provide the resources that are needed, absolutely do them. But also remember what your priorities are to reduce problem youth behavior. Telling your story, we talked about uh, marketing also, you know, through your programs, if you're, I keep using Strengthening Families 10 to 14, but insert whatever program you're doing here. But if you're at Strengthening Families 10 to 14, before our families would eat, I would always stand up and talk to them a little bit each week about all of the other efforts that were happening in our, um, in our coalition also. And for those 10 families, they, they may or may not have done this, but think about how many people they come in contact with, how many people they could share that information with. You can use that marketing uh, to engage stakeholders far beyond just those, those 10 people when you have the conversation with them. I feel like I've talked a lot now for the last, uh, probably longer than I told you I was going to, Janine, but I'd like to see if you, anybody has any questions, comments, or other um, additions to those. The last slide is one that I use for, uh, this comes from the communities, the care material for, from the University of Washington that I love when we do funding and sustainability trainings. It talks about how you know, federal and state grants are over here on the left in terms of being sporadic, short-term, not very flexible, and distant authority. And all the way over on the right is your local agency and, and public, uh, or local public and agency funding. They're more consistent, they're more long-term, more flexible, and you have more authority over how to spend those funds with the local service clubs and United Way and foundations kind of falling somewhere in the middle. But we can also think of this in terms of stakeholders, um, what each stakeholder is looking for, and then thinking about your own coalition. Who are the stakeholders that, that exist in your community in terms of the local public or agencies? Uh, are there stakeholders that may be local clubs or service clubs, Rotary or uh, the Elks or uh, the Moose or, you know, any, the American Legion is, is uh, one that a, a coalition shared with me recently they had a great relationship with. Uh, the United Way or other agencies and foundations like the United Way. And then uh, those state and federal partners, what, are the, what would they be looking for? And do you have any um, stakeholders that exist in that domain as well? Or local government. And that is my last slide. I'm, um, I'm sure that is not everything I wanted to cover today, but recognizing that that comes from mostly from my experience, which may differ from yours, but hopefully you're able to take some of those things away and think about ways that you may apply them in your community. I see we have about 10 minutes left and I definitely want to respect everybody's schedules, but I'd be interested. At, Janine, I don't know if you have any slides after this, but I'd like to see if anybody has any questions or comments on these. Thank you, Jeff. No, um, please, if, if anyone has um, other ideas, questions, comments, um, we'd love to hear from you. Um, it looks like uh, Julie mentioned in the chat um, 
Past and present participants are great public relations partners serving on other boards, task forces, and committees gives you a chance to share your programs. Great, great point, Julie. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, the last thing I'll say is if I learned anything from my kind of my mentor, Kathy Peffer, uh, who, who I said earlier created this training with me, um, was to form relationships. And we, we talk a lot about it, Kathy and I, in terms of you know, dollars and cents funding and those uh, in-kind contributions. But no matter what came up where I would say, Kathy, how did you fund this? Or I see you got funds from your local American Legion. How did you form that relationship? Kathy either knew somebody or a member of Kathy's board knew somebody that had a cousin who um, those relationships uh, and, and engaging as diverse a representation of your community for stakeholders as you can is so crucial, both in terms of representing everybody in your community for your data. Everybody in your community should have a, the feeling that, they, that they're represented and their voice is present for your efforts, but also as you're looking for uh, funding to sustain those efforts too. Great point, Jeff. I think it's easy to say, and it's true, um, how difficult and how much work it can be involved, right? In, like you said, I think right at the beginning of that first slide of yours, forming those relationships, building those relationships, it takes time. It takes a lot of time, but it is amazing that time and effort put in of who ends up knowing whom, right? Um, and, and where resources and sustainable, um, sustainable resources and engagement can really come from. Um, I know this person who knows this person who knows this person. And it might've taken a while to form that initial relationship and engage that initial person. Um, but then it just blossoms into a beautiful flower, um, you know, when, when that initial effort is put in. And sometimes, you know, we talk about how hard it is um, to build relationships or how, how long it can take. Sometimes relationships happen at the drop of a hat too. And you just think, you know, some divine intervention put this person in my path for a reason. Um, and, and it's, you know, for good purpose too. So um, I, I think it's, it's that, that is absolutely always one of the big pieces, um, you know, is, is building those relationships. Yeah, I like to share examples. And I don't know, this may be the, the worst one I've ever actually used in a training, but I'm, I'm gonna, this is what popped into my head as you and I were talking, Janine. How many of you on the call have ever watched the TV show, The Simpsons? It's been years since I've watched it, but so I'm a Packers fan and one of the football games ended Sunday night and, and it like came on TV and I'm like, oh, my kids can't watch that. Like I'm turning the TV real channel real quick, but it popped into my head because at the beginning of those Simpsons episodes, there's always something goofy that happens and you're like, that has no bearing on the show whatsoever, but they always have a way to like weave it back in, like why the goofy thing happened at the beginning. Sometimes relationships are like that. You may not have a plan for how to engage, say that county commissioner. But through talking to somebody, maybe they know the county commissioner or they know somebody who's going to be in a meeting. And, and sometimes those things happen in ways that we don't plan. But it's great to have a plan in place, but also recognize that sometimes they happen uh, outside of our plan. Absolutely. Right. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, we really appreciate your time. Um, we appreciate you and all the work you do in your communities um, to support children, youth, students, and families, um, because without you, um, a lot of the good, um, just it, it just wouldn't be occurring. So thank you for your efforts and knowing um, all the hard work you're doing. Thank you for taking um, the time today, this morning, um, to listen to our thoughts um, and sharing of ideas. Um, we, we really appreciate everything that you do every single day. Um, if there's anything that, that we can do for you moving forward in terms of EPIS, um, please feel free to reach out if you aren't already working with us. Um, you know, we're more than happy to continue discussions and dialogue, in particular around community engagement, um, since that's our focus today. Um, but really, um, you know, the whole continuum of, of support that we can provide around um, bringing programming and, and coalition work um, to the communities across PA. Um, again, as I mentioned earlier, 
we, this is the third of five of the sustainability webinar series. Um, in two weeks, we will reconvene and talk about uh, staff retention and development, which I think um, is definitely a huge topic and, and really anxious to hear um, the information and the feedback on that. So thank you again for your work. Have a great rest of your day. And um, you know we hope to see you down the road. Thanks everybody.